Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Forgiveness in 2021, How the Economic Aid Act is Changing PPP. And today we're going to be focusing on loans under $150,000. I'm Yonina F. Scheinweather, CPA, the Consulting Director of Compliance at Viventium. And today we're going to be taking a look at two of what I call the most elusive forms in PPP forgiveness, and that's the 3508EZ and the 3508S. And both of those forms purport to be simpler, more straightforward, more streamlined than the long, long forgiveness process that was originally released uh, going on almost a year ago, well, not quite, uh, by SPA, SBA. Um, and it would seem to be that they would be a lot simpler and just make our lives easier. Uh, what we're going to take a look at today, though, is some of the hidden pitfalls, and that's why I call them elusive forms, uh, that are buried in these forms. And because they're kind of made to be simpler, they're also kind of more tricky and more caution is needed if you're actually going to elect to use these forms. So that's basically what we're going to be taking a look at today. Just a couple pieces of housekeeping. I want to mention that Today's webinar is being recorded, and I, I know I always get this question. The slides and the recording will be made available to you after the presentation so that you can share them with coworkers or review them. Um, and uh, let's take a look at um, your toolbar over there, your go to webinar toolbar. You have a little section there called questions. And on that question side, um, you can go ahead and use that throughout the webinar to enter anything that you might want a little further clarification on or any general questions on PPP forgiveness that you may have. I encourage you to do that because I do keep a look and, and I do keep an eye on that question toolbar. And at the end of the webinar, I will try to allow some Q&A time so we can address some of your questions. If there's something that is not so clear to you or that you feel needs further elaboration, then probably is not so clear and needs further elaboration to other people too. So, you know, do go ahead and take advantage of that question toolbar. Uh, the second piece of housekeeping that I want to mention is that Viventium is not an SBA qualified lender. We do not grant or approve SBA loans or PPP loans. We are not engaged in the practice of rendering legal or tax advice. And therefore, any determinations, any business decisions that you're going to make should not be based on any of the content in this webinar, but rather with discussing the content of this webinar with your tax advisor or your legal counsel or your authorized SBA lender. Okay, that's all the small print. Uh, let's jump in and get started. So we all know that something changed. We know that there was a new law signed called the Economic Aid Act that extended and expanded the Paycheck Protection Program of SBA. Let's take a little bit of a look of where that falls in context of the legislation and all, all the different changes that are happening to us in terms of employers dealing with coronavirus response and relief. On December 27, 2020, a giant piece of legislation, kind of like a very large umbrella, it was a $2.3 trillion federal budget, was signed into law by then President Trump. It was called the CAA. You may have seen that if you've been, been, been reading any articles. A lot of people talk about the CAA. It's what's called the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Now, that CAA was really comprised of many, 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 many different acts and different laws. Matter of fact, that CAA had 32 different divisions, Division A, B, C, all the way through FF. And the two divisions that concern employers in terms of payroll issues for coronavirus response and relief are Division N and Division EE. Now today, we're zooming in on Division N. Division N, among other things, has the two acts that affect the FFCRA credits, that's the COVID-related tax relief act. And what's of interest to us today, it has the economic aid to hard hit small businesses, nonprofits, and Venues Act, and that's an extension and expansion of PPP. And it's that economic, it's for short, we call it the Economic Aid Act. That is what is gonna comprise the changes that we're gonna be taking a look at today. Now, I also wanna point out that we're focusing today on the smaller size loans, loans from $150,000 and down. If you are contemplating or you already have a loan that's more than that, I would encourage you to join us for a separate session where we take a look at loans that are more than $150,000. There is some 
overlap because there's uh, there is overlap between the two some provisions are common to both and then there's some unique features of those loans that are the big ones more than 150,000 and there's some other unique features which is what we're going to be zooming in on now uh, in terms of the smaller loans that go from 150,000 and down so let's first of all take a look at this economic aid act and what are its main provisions first thing it did was it said there are new groups of employers that can qualify for an SBA PPP loan. Those would include certain media, newspaper that were pre previously disqualified because they were part of a bigger conglomerate. It would include uh, direct marketing, DMOs, direct marketing organizations. Uh, it would include certain agricultural concerns, rural areas. Um, and really this, this new round, if you will, of PPP is, was geared specifically to bring PPP funding to smaller employers, to those who wouldn't necessarily have access to these kinds of loan come grants that can really help them stay afloat in these very challenging times. And therefore, they even get a head start in the race because, you know, we all know that there's a limited amount of funding, although there's quite a bit that's been allocated, but still we, we've seen PPP run out of funding once before. And so uh, Congress granted, or actually SBA granted, a head start to smaller community-based lenders, banks, financial institutions. And um, it said for the first few days of the program, when it first opened its doors, only those smaller lenders, those community-based financial institutions were able to grant loans. Um, and uh, after they got that money out there uh, to the smaller employers, and they did a great job in the first few days, then the larger banks were also granted the ability to open up this second round of loans. So in addition to the, the expanded categories of employers, we also have an expanded categories of expenses that now qualify for forgiveness. And we're going to be zooming in on this soon. There are many, many more categories of what you are allowed to get a loan for and subsequently request forgiveness for, because your loan application and your forgiveness application are really two sides of the same coin. Um, what goes on one goes on the other, basically, except the forgiveness, you have to justify the money that you asked for and you're asking for forgiveness for, but there's they, they, they've really broadened the category. And as we'll see, um, that can even mean more money into your first round loan. Your, um, the, 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 I want to distinguish between the round of loans and the draw of loans. First round loans were the loans that were authorized by the CARES Act as of March 27th, 2020. Oh, and by the way, as a special bonus on today's webinar, you're going to get a graphic, an infographic, one of the great Vivendium infographics, to just try to keep track of all these PPP changes and laws and expansions and flexibilities, and it just gives you kind of a roadmap of where PPP was at and where it's heading. Um, so back on March 27th, the CARES uh, 2020, that is, the CARES Act was passed that authorized these types of loans that were to become grants or forgivable loans, as we call them. And that was called the first round, if you will. We didn't know then that it was going to be a second round, but now we talk about that as first round loans. Um, and that was open until August 8th, 2020. Now, with the passing of the Economic Aid Act, uh, there's a second round of loans that will stay open till March 31st, 2021, if not extended. And that second round of loans allows first draw loans and second draw loans. First draw loans mean people who just, for whatever reason, didn't take PPP loans before. Either they weren't eligible or they were a little bit nervous about doing it. They were afraid maybe it won't be considered a necessity. And when they look at the new rules, they see, oh yeah, we can do this. And they decide to take their first draw loan. Or it could be for those people who already got loans in the first round, and now they've used it all up and they still need more help and they're ready for a second draw loan. So the Economic Aid Act authorized another round of PPP loans, but not for all businesses. First of all, you can't be publicly traded for the new round of loans. Uh, you have to have 300 employees or less. If you remember the first time around, it was 500 or less. And here's something new. You have to be able to show a decrease of 25% in some quarter's revenue compared to 2019. And you're going to have to certify this and you're going to have to be prepared to provide that documentation. Now, a couple points here that in order to get a second draw loan, you have to have used up your first draw. 
can't like have outstanding funds in your first draw and go for a second draw. And that's going to be one of the certifications. And when we dig into the forms, we're going to see that there. You're going to have to certify that. Um, and some questions that have come our way is, can you get your second draw loan from a different lender? Or do you have to go back to your original bank? And the answer is, absolutely, you can go to a second lender. There's no restriction about that. However, you may find it easier to go to your original lender because they may actually be able to populate your loan application with the same data and the same information that you had there before, and it might just make your process more streamlined, especially if you already have a relationship with them. But you know, ultimately, there's no requirement that you borrow from the same lender. Now, another provision of the Economic Aid Act, which nobody's quite sure what to do with, or very few people are sure what to do with, let's put it that way, is that your first draw loans, in other words, your first round, if you took loans back before August 8th, you can request an increase in that first loan amount. Let's say now because of the expanded expenses, and we'll soon look at a laundry list of what those expanded expenses are, but let's say because of those expanded expenses, you realize, wow, we could have actually, if we had only known this back then, we could have borrowed more and we could have used those funds for stuff that we had to pay out of pocket and we would have gotten forgiveness for it. Well, it's not something that you have to regret. You can actually go ahead and do that. You can actually go back and request an increase to your first draw loan. Now we are hearing though that some lenders are not yet supporting this feature and I would postulate the reason why is because SBA has not yet issued guidance about how that's supposed to happen, meaning they've released loan applications for a, a first draw or a second draw loan, but they haven't released any application that says, you know, 3508I for increase or something like that, you know, either for applying for the loan or for getting it forgiven. We haven't, we haven't seen any documentation or, or too much guidance on the part of SBA about how that would happen yet. So I'm just postulating that lenders are kind of taking a wait and see approach. Let's let's wait for SBA to give us some additional guidance so we know what to do about these increased loans and how to handle them. And then at that point, we'll support it. Now, of course, if you don't want to wait and you say, well, look, I've, I've used up the funds in my first round loan. I, there's nothing, no money left there. I could either wait and see if I'll be able to get an increase, or I could go for a second draw loan. And if your tax advisor says, well, it probably doesn't pay to wait, you know, why why risk the spending? Then you may want to go for the second draw and forget about expand, expanding it. Or if your tax advisor says, no, no, guidance will be coming out. SBA is not going to leave people hanging. So just hang in there a couple more days. Well, you know, go ahead and follow that advice. The team is not really expressing an opinion about that. Just putting it out there um, that you know that may be a decision, a crossroads that you're going to need to figure out which way to go. Now, the maximum loan that you can get in the second round, no matter if it's a first draw or a second draw, is only two million dollars. As you remember, the first PPP loans back in the CARES Act days was ten million dollars. And here, whether it's a first draw or a second draw, um, each loan can be up to a maximum of two million dollars. There is also a mandate by Congress that SBA produce, ACE or the Treasury produce, a simplified forgiveness form for those people with loans under $150,000. And the reason I have that bolded there is because we're gonna focus on that a lot today. And it's very easy to mistake a simplified forgiveness form for simplified forgiveness. And this is one of the biggest pitfalls of the simplification of the 3508S that can come back to haunt you. And my goal is when everyone walks away from this webinar today, you're going to have a thorough understanding of the difference between simplified forgiveness and a simplified forgiveness form. Two last important points of the Economic Aid Act, and this is good news for your corporate tax returns. Under the original law, if you took payroll, if you took expenses and claimed them for forgiveness on your PPP, mortgage interest, rent, utilities, you could not use those expenses as a corporate tax, deduct, tax deduction on your corporate, on your company's corporate return. The IRS's reasoning was it's double dipping. Look, if it's a, a forgivable loan, means the treasury is paying for your expenses. We're not going to let you then take those as a deduction. And the business community and the CPA community were lobbying day and night practically against this. They were saying this is not the intention of Congress. Congress certainly did not want to take away any existing deductions in this difficult financial and every way time for employers, and it wouldn't be fair. 
Anyway, their lobbying efforts seem to have paid off because indeed in the Economic Aid Act, there is a provision that even if you've used expenses to claim forgiveness on your PPP loan, you can still go ahead and take those expenses on your corporate tax return. And finally, something we're not going to go into in detail now, but I will invite you to visit the COVID Solutions page of Eventing for more information about this. And that is the ERC, the Employee Retention Credit. It's now being allowed retroactively, even if you have a PPP loan. Remember, we kind of had a mantra, whoever has a PPP loan can take the employee retention credit. They're not letting that kind of double dipping. So Economic Aid Act has changed that, and they said, no, we're going to allow both. You can take PPP, and you can get ERC, and you can even get the ERC retroactively. Like, let's say you're saying, oh, if only I had known that, I could have used that money. Well, you can still get it. You're allowed to go back and amend your second, third, quarter, fourth quarter 941s in 2020 and claim those employee retention credits. One caveat though, and this is a double dipping that they're not going to allow, you can't use the same wages for both the employee retention and for forgiveness. Meaning if you have employees who are on retention and you're paying them and you want that government subsidy of that salary, then any wages that you claim the employee retention credit on cannot be listed as PPP payroll costs. That would really be double dipping that they're not going to allow. So uh, while the two credits are not mutually exclusive anymore, they are coordinated that you can either, well, for, for, for a given wage, you can either claim the employee retention credit or the PPP loan and forgiveness. There are five basic changes that the Economic Aid Act funnels down to the forgiveness process. First of all, these changes apply to all new loans whether it's a first draw or a second draw, anybody who applied for a new loan under the Economic Aid Act gets to use all these expansions and flexibilities when they go for forgiveness. What if you had an existing loan from back from the first round and from between the you know, CARES Act, March 27th and, April, and August 8th of 2020, you had an old loan and you've already applied for forgiveness? Well, then it depends. If your forgiveness was granted, already by the SBA, then you're kind of out of luck. And if you didn't get full forgiveness, you can't go back and say, oh, wait, but I have more expenses. I have more things to claim. No, you got, that's done, it's finished already. Um, on the other hand, if you haven't applied for forgiveness yet, then go right ahead. And even if it's an old loan, you can take advantage of all of these new leniencies and flexibilities. What if you're in that twilight zone, you submitted your forgiveness application to your authorized lender, but you haven't gotten a forgiveness decision yet. So that's kind of a gray area and Ventium's best practice advice there is check with your authorized SBA lender. So if you have already submitted your application and you think you may be at risk for not getting full forgiveness and you wanna take advantage and modify your application, the first thing I would do tomorrow morning is pick up your phone, call your lender and ask them, what about if I applied for forgiveness, but I haven't received it yet, can I still expand it? So let's take a look at these five changes. First of all, I mentioned there are new expenses that are available to you in addition to mortgage interest, rent, utilities. And those new expenses are operating expenses that would include product delivery, service delivery costs, sales and billing, back office, uh, cloud computing, fees to payroll and HR providers. Any type of operations expense is now a forgivable expense. Similarly, any cost to suppliers, whether it's for supplies that are essential to operations or supplies that are already existed, already contracted prior to your covered period, um, or even during your covered period if it's for perishables, any supplier costs. Any property damage costs that were caused by the public disturbances of 2020 and that were not covered by your insurance policy, those can now be included as expenses on your PPP and ask included in your forgiveness amount. And finally, the fourth one is any worker protection expenditures. That would include PPE for your employees. That would include any modifications to your facilities that are necessary in order to comply with any rule promulgated by Health and Human Services, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or OSHA. It would not include modifications required under state or local law. 
only under these three federal bodies. But if you had to, you know, erect partitions or build additional facilities, windows, airing systems, any anything in order to comply with COVID-related safety, you can claim those expenses, and they can be quite large, toward your forgiveness. This is great news, um, and therefore it will in, enable our employers to request an increase in their first loan amount once the SBA kind of coordinates that and, and lenders, you know, actually know how to do that. Um, but there's still one important caveat, and that is the total of all these non-payroll expenses still cannot exceed 40% of the amount you're requesting for forgiveness. That's like fixed. That's what we told, we call the 60% payroll rule. In other words, if you're requesting forgiveness for $100,000, then at least 60,000 of those dollars have to have been spent on qualified payroll costs. And only 40,000 are available, should, could be you know, used for supply or worker protection, operations, mortgage interest, utilities, all that. It falls into the category of non-payroll expenses, which are limited to 40% of your forgiveness amount. So it may not be helpful for too many folks, especially if you've used up most of your funds just on payroll, but it's good to know that it's there in case it will apply. What's probably much more relevant to more people are is the new laundry list of payroll expenses. These are things, expenses that are actually called payroll. They, they count toward the 60% of your forgiveness amount. We already know that compensation, even paid time off, tips, um, well, pay time off except for FFCRA mandated leave, that doesn't count as payroll expenses, but other types of pay time off does. Um, and we also knew, if you remember back when, and you can find some old uh, webinars archived if you want to go back and listen, but in the olden days, we were able to take employer contributions to employee health insurance, employer contributions to employee retirement plans, and state and local taxes paid by employers, not federal, not like FUTA, but SUDA would qualify, state unemployment. Well, there's a bunch of new expenses that have been added. Anything that the employer pays for any type of employee insurance, it could be group life, it could be vision plans, dental, even disability, such as long-term disability, even if it's a state-required disability, like in New York and New Jersey, where the state requires employers to contribute to the employee's disability funds, these expenses that the employer pays are now all countable as payroll expenses. So that is great news. That ups the amount that you're going to be able to include as qualified payroll expenses. Flexible covered period. Well, now, those of you on our call whose loans are less than $50,000 um, will still be interested in this change, and then the next two won't apply as much. So this change says that you know how you used to be able to take a loan and call your covered period for forgiveness either eight weeks or 24 weeks, well, that's changed. It can be now any date between eight and 24 weeks, meaning your covered period still has to start on your loan disbursement date, um, but it can end nine weeks in, 10 weeks in, 11, 20. Now, those of you who are with Eventium or uh, have you know other great payroll service providers should be able, and with Ventium you can, to run a report where you just keep on toggling and say, well, let's do eight weeks, let's do nine weeks, let's do 10 weeks. And these reports should be free of charge as they are in Eventium and see which way comes out best. When do you maximize your forgiveness? If you use a 13-week covered period, if you use an 18-week covered period, when do your numbers work best for getting you full forgiveness? So that is the next flexibility. Can't be later than September 30th of 2021. And also the SBA has done away with what we call the alternative covered period. Perhaps some of you who, who you know, looked into the original forgiveness forms or were with Eventium for earlier webinars remember what that was. You, you, you could either have started your covered period on your loan disbursement date or on the first payroll period begin after the loan disbursement date. And they did that purposely to make it easier for employers to just track payroll by payroll and not to have to go back and allocate. We're not quite sure why, but they did away with the alternative covered period. They're making you start on the date of your disbursement, even if it's in the middle of a pay cycle, um, but they are being more flexible about when it can end. Okay, now what I was starting to say about those of you under $50,000, if you're under $50,000, just as before, you're covered under the SBA's de minimis rule, 
you don't have to worry about wage reductions. You could be paying your employees a quarter of their salary and you could still get full forgiveness if you used up your funds. And you don't have to worry about FTE full-time equivalency headcount reductions. You could have slashed your staff by a third and you would still get full forgiveness as long as you used your, your money on these payroll costs. But that's only if your loan was less than $50,000. If your loan is less than 150,000, or I should say 150,000 or less, you still use that simplified form, which we're going to look at when we get more hands on in the second part of the webinar. Well, you still use the 3508S, but, and this is where it really gets tricky, you still have to calculate wage and FTE reductions if you have any. Meaning, what Congress told SBA, and SBA took this very literally. If someone has a loan of less than $150,000, you have to provide a simplified process. So SBA took that to mean, we'll give you a simplified form, but you're still gonna have to do all the same work. And this is, I think, the biggest pitfall, the biggest takeaway that those of you who are between 50 and 150 in your loan amount, the biggest takeaway I'd like you to walk away with, and we're gonna see this, if it's not clear yet, it'll become a little clearer when we look at it on the form. Now, those of you who don't have to deal, if less than 50,000 who don't have to deal with reductions, don't have to listen to change number five. But those of you who are between 50 and 150,000 or more than 150,000, you may remember that there is a safe harbor that if your reductions happened, whether it was wage reduction or a headcount reduction, if it happened between February 15th and April 26, 2020, why those dates? At that point, that's what Congress thought was going to be the the, the, the highlight of COVID, the hardest time of COVID, little did we know what was coming. Um, so that's written into the law between February 15th and April 26, 2020. Um, if that's when your reductions happened and you restore them by some date called the payroll comparison date, then you won't be penalized as long as you get those numbers back up. You were allowed previously to pick any date you wanted as long as it wasn't after December 31st, 2020. That has now been extended to September 30th, 2021. Now the long form, 3508, that spells out all the safe harbors actually has a mistake on it. And it, it's, why do, I, why do I say it's a mistake? Because it con contradicts the interim final rule that SBA published and the rule is more authoritative than the form. But again, I, I'm not an attorney and I want you to check this with your own tax advisors. On the form, it says you can only use either December 31st or if you're, if you're a, a loan that happened after December 27th under the new law, um, you can only use the date of your covered period. You can't use an earlier date. It just says for your comparison, check if your numbers came up on December 31st slash end of covered period in 2021, whichever one applies to you, but not before. And that is not what the previous forms did. It's also not what the interim final rule states. So we're hoping for some guidance from SBA to clarify that. Um, and that is definitely, if that apply, if you're in that kind of a situation, that is definitely something you want to take up with your tax advisor or your counsel. So let's now start taking a look up close and personal at these two elusive forms, 3508EZ and 3508S. Now the EZ, as its name implies, is intended to be an easier process. It's used for a first row loan and or a second draw loan, but not for both at the same time. You have to file separately for your loans. And you can only use it under certain circumstances. First of all, if you're eligible for 3508S, meaning your loan is from 50 to 150, you don't use the EZ. SBA says, please use the S. It's a one page form, and then there's a second page of certification. So we're not looking at any worksheets or any Schedule Eights. Who can use this easy process? So on the left-hand side, you have the legalese of it. In short, in English, on the right, on the, uh, that was on the right-hand side, sorry. On the left-hand side, you have it in plain English. You can use it whether this is a first draw loan that you're asking forgiveness for or a second draw loan. It's for loans more than $150,000. So they say here, if your loan amount is $150,000 or less, please use SBA Form 3508S. And it can be used if you did not have any wage reductions for your any one employee of more than 25%, and you also didn't have any FTE reductions, unless certain safe harbors apply. Like it states here, you know, you, you, you didn't have any FTE reductions, but ignore reductions that arose from an inability to rehire individuals, da, 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 
or also ignore reductions if uh, it's an employee hours that you that you offered the employee to come back to work and the employee refused. So there's certain safe harbors that even if you had FTE reductions, you can still use the, the easy form. Basically though, it's a form without reductions on it. In other words, every time you have a wage reduction or an FTE reduction that does not fall into a safe harbor, your forgiveness is gonna suffer. Your forgiveness is gonna get reduced. You use the EZ when you didn't have reductions. So there's no reduction to your forgiveness. You didn't have wage reductions and you didn't have any non-safe harbor FTE reductions. And there's nothing that's going to be reducing your forgiveness. Let's take a look at the 3508 EZ. Here it is, dated January 19th, 2021. That's the new form. What's changed on the face of the form? First of all, there's a new line here that makes you check off if this is for a first draw or a second draw loan. And remember, as we explained, it's either one or the other. You have to use separate forms for each loan. You can't combine them. Second of all, there is only a covered period. As we mentioned earlier, there is no alternative covered period. You must start counting from the date of your loan disbursement. You can't use your payroll period beginning after your loan disbursement. Now, for those of you who are with Viventium, you can just breathe a collective sigh of relief because the Ventium system has you covered for this. You put in the date of your loan disbursement and we automatically include all the checks that need to be included, prorated properly. Those of you who are not yet with Ventium, I suggest that you go back to your payroll providers or partners or software and just as a best practice, ask them now that there is no alternative covered period, will you be able, let's say our payroll starts on a Wednesday and we got our loan disbursement on a Monday, um, will you know how to coordinate those two dates and make it happen properly? Of course, the ending date is whenever you say it is, as long as it's between eight and 24 weeks from the time of your disbursement. Another change, big bold here, lines five, six, seven, and eight. Those are all your non-payroll costs. You see above we have mortgage interest, rent or lease, uh, employer taxes. Um, here we have all the new ones, the operation expenses, property damage due to riots, not covered by insurance, supplier costs, and PPE or facility costs to ensure worker safety. So those are all here now on the face of the form. Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. You put down your payroll costs, put down all your non-payroll costs, and there's no reductions. It's not like you have to figure wage or FTE reductions because you only use this form when you're not subject to reduction. You sum the amounts, you get your PPP loan amount, you apply the 60 percent rule and it's the smallest of those three numbers. In other words, either your eligible costs or you know your 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 uh, grossed up amount of your loan, meaning it can't, your forgiveness cannot exceed 60 your your forgiveness must be at least 60% payroll. I always say that backwards. And uh, your PPP loan amount. Obviously you can't get forgiveness, even if you used up a lot more in expenses, you can't get forgiveness for more than your loan amount. You take the smallest of all three numbers, you put it down there on line 12 and you're done except for an interesting fact that you see what's not on this form? If you remember on your first form, there used to be the, those of you who got economic injury disaster loan advances, those were deducted from your forgiveness. So there's good news here for you. And that is that the EIDL advances no longer have to be returned. They do not reduce your forgiveness. But lest we think we're really done, we're gonna go over now to the certifications. And I've boxed off for you here uh, some changes. You have a full page of certifications by signing below. Now, it's kind of interesting that in the olden days, and I mean by the original round of loans that ended on August 8th of last year, there was no limit or um, amount that said that you couldn't use the easy form, meaning you weren't forced to use the S form. That's probably because the easy form came out before the S. And so if you wanted to, you could use the easy. And then of course it was to your advantage if you were 50, the S in those days was only for 50,000 or less, uh, it was to your advantage to use the S. Now we're being told clearly, EZ and S don't mix. In other words, EZ is for people who have loans that are more than $150,000, they just don't need to do reductions. If they needed to do reductions, wage reductions or FTE reductions that aren't covered by safe harbors, then they have to go do that long form, the 3508 with all of its attendant schedules. And for more information about that, we have some you know, sessions scheduled for Venteam to discuss those forms, the ones that are focusing on the 3508. 
one of the worst forms in the history of uh, <laughs> of um, loan programs. But you know, it's it's people are getting a lot of assistance from this, and and we do want to make sure, and SBA and the government wants to make sure that the money's being used responsibly. So you know, the, you, you reach out to your payroll service and you make sure they can do it for you with a smile on their face, as Event Team does. Um, but you don't want to do a 3508 unless you have to, let's put it that way. So if you are more than 150,000 in your loan, but you don't have reductions, then easy is the form for you. If you're less than 150,000, whether or not you have reductions, you're being asked to please use the 3508S. So what's different about the certifications that you make on the 3508EZ? Well, first of all, there's a difference in the way owner employees have their cap, have their compensation listed and limited. You know that when you're counting payroll compensation, you can't count more than $100,000 for any employee on an annual basis, and that's prorated over your covered period. So for example, if you're using an eight-week covered period, eight weeks out of $100,000 is 15,385. You cannot count more than $15,385 for any one employee when you ask for forgiveness. If you're using a 24 week, you will be 24 weeks out of 52 times 100,000, and that would be your limit. If you're using 10 weeks, it would be, we'll, we'll look at some examples of this in a little while. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, what they're stating here, though, is that employee owner limits, in addition to being subject to the regular limits of every employee, you know, the prorated amount of 100,000, are also subject to a limit that it can't exceed more than two and a half months of compensation during whichever year you use to calculate your, your loan. Meaning if we're looking at a 2020 loan, you would have used 2019. And that's the year you have to look back for your owner employee compensations. And if you took a loan in 2021, of course you use 2020, most likely as your basis year. And therefore you would be looking at the employee owner compensation there. And we're gonna look at this a little more carefully, but this is something you need to be certifying. You're also certifying that you submitted the documentation for mortgage interest, this is the second box, business, rent or lease, business utility, and all the new things, operations expenditures, covered property damage, supplier costs, and worker protection. So you have to certify that you have submitted that documentation. And finally, at the bottom here, um, you're certifying that if you had a pre-December 27th loan. And you might say, well, why such an odd date, December 27th? Because remember, that's when the Economic Aid Act was signed into law. That's why it kind of helps to understand the background. If your loan predated the Economic Aid Act, then you have uh, till the end of December, in other words, December 2020, um, to rehire any individuals that you want, you tried to, or, or equivalent individuals that you, you know, ha that you uh, had laid off. And if it's a post-2027 loan, 12-27 loan, uh, then you have until the end of your covered period. So that's a certification that that has been that was an old certification. It's just modified to make reference to a post-December 27th loan, in which case you're not limited to get that back up by December 31st. You have till the end of the covered period. And finally, there is a certification that you were unable to operate between February 15th and the end of your covered period. Um, at your pre-February 15th, 2020, that's your pre-COVID level, because of laws passed by, or regulations passed by HHS or CDC or OSHA, and those can be rules uh, used to be for your old loans just through December 31st, but if you have a post-1227 loan, it would run through the end of your covered period in 2021, which means if OSHA passes some kind of, if you have a loan that runs a covered period that's going to run through May of 2021, and on April 30th, OSHA passes some kind of a new regulation, and that so severely limits someone's business that they can't be operating at a level that they were pre-COVID, then, uh, then they're exempt from the FTE reduction problem. They don't have to worry about it. And as long as that law was in there before the end of their covered period. So the, the, basically the language and the certifications has been modified for those post-December 27th loans to extend some of the benefits, some of the flexibility, all the way to the end of their covered period in 2021. So those are the certifications. 
And that's it. The easy is just a one page form. But I told you we we're going to look a little bit more for those of you who may have owner employees. So first of all, we're to when we say owner employees, it means they have to own a more than 5% share in the business. And the instructions that discuss owner employee compensation state, the certification that actually that you're certifying states, that for each individual owner, you're capping their compensation at two and a half months of 100,000 per year, which is 20,833, or two and a half months of their compensation in their look back year, whether it was 2019 or 2020, whichever is lower. So the requirements on owner employees have gotten a bit more stringent, um, which is kind of in keeping with the general motif of the second round, right? It's for smaller employers, it's for a smaller amount, and they're not really looking as much to subsidize owner employees as they are to the you know everyday employee. And so there's greater restrictions placed on owner employees. And that, in a nutshell, is the EZ. Believe it or not, the 3508S is more complicated than the EZ. I'm telling you that from the get-go. Um, and for the rest of the time, other than questions and answers, we're going to focus on the 3508S. Again, it applies whether you are in a first-draw loan or a second-draw loan. And it's used for loans that are less than or equal to $150,000. It's deceptively simple in the way it looks. It's only half a page plus some certifications. And believe it or not, it is more potentially dangerous from a compliance standpoint than that whole long 3508 and its Schedule A and its Schedule A worksheet. Why is that? Well, if you remember, towards the end of 2020, the SBA released a de minimis rule, and the exact dates you'll see when we take a look at our history infographic that you're going to get at the end of the webinar. Um, SBA said, you know what, any loan that's less than $50,000 is really a de minimis situation. And even if you had wage reductions, even if you had FTE reductions, as long as you used up all your funds for qualified costs, we're just going to forgive the whole thing. So just to take an extreme example, let's say you borrowed $45,000 from the SBA and you use that $45,000 to pay your workforce, except you cut your workforce in a third, you laid off two thirds of your workforce, and those people who are left, you cut their hours, and you also cut their salaries down by 50%, like really, really strict, you know, strict cuts. You would get full forgiveness for that $45,000. As long as you used it all for qualified expenses, we don't look at your wage reductions. We don't look at your FTE reductions. There was an expansion of that forgiveness for those loans that are less than $50,000. SBA just said, we're just forgiving it. As long as you used it up and you're certified that you used it up, go ahead. And we gave you a form called the 3508S simplified to use in these situations. Well and good. Along came Cong Congress in the Economic Aid Act, and they said, well, we are charging you Treasury, SBA, with creating a simplified process for loans that are not just less than 50,000, but that are less than 150,000. So you know what SBA did? They took the easy way out. They said, okay, 3508S, this form. Now use it for loans, not only less than 50,000, use it for loans that are less than 150,000. Ah, very nice. You met Congress's requirement. But if you read the fine print, if you have a loan that's between 50,000 and 150,000, you still have to worry about wage reductions and FTE reductions if you've had them. And your forgiveness is still going to be reduced, except they don't make it easy for you. They don't spell it out this line, now subtract your wage, now get your FTE reduction quotient, now multiply your reduction quotient by your modified free. They don't do anything. They just say, tell us the amount that you're asking forgiveness for and certify that you did it all in the way that you're supposed to. It's like a built-in implied calculation. So let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's the 3508S, which is deceptively simple. It's less than half a page. It says clearly, you may only use this form if your loan is $50,000 or less. Has all the same special features. It's again, this is the new line for first or second draw covered period, but no alternative covered period. And then all it asks you is the amount of money you spent on the payroll costs and how much you're asking forgiveness for. Wow, what could be simpler than that? And the truth is, if you're a less than $50,000 loan, then yeah, that's great. And there's, again, there's no EIDL advances on here. They don't have to be repaid. They're no longer deducted for forgiveness. 
problem is buried in the small print. If you flip a few pages down and you keep reading after the form is over and you have all that small print, there's something there, long paragraph, FTE salary wage reductions. The yellow highlighting is not done by SBA, it's done by Viventium. And it says, read the sentence with me. If the borrower does not satisfy these requirements, meaning you, you haven't kept up your wages and you haven't fallen into any safe harbors for your reductions, and is potentially subject to reduction in its requested loan forgiveness amount, the borrower must follow SBA Form 3508 and its instructions to calculate its requested loan forgiveness amount. That means the full nine yards, wage reductions for those who earn less than 100,000. It means FTE reduction calculations, quotients, dividing your FTE now during your covered period by your FTE during your reference look back period, picking your, if you have a choice of two reference look back periods, and if you're seasonal, you have a choice of a third. I, it means the whole nine yards of the 3508S. Well, why not just tell you use the 3508S? You know why not? Because Congress said, that the SBA must provide a simplified process for those who use less than, who, those who borrow less than 150,000. So instead of giving them a form which would spell out step by step the way the 3508 does, which wouldn't look simplified, they said, here, you know, do it all yourself. <laughs> you know, do your calculations with your payroll service and, and on, on the back end, and then just put one line there that says, how much forgiveness do you want? Now that doesn't really save any employers any work. They still have to do all the same work and I, I, I fear that those are, who are not attending the Ventium webinars or similar, similarly reading carefully or have you know, good tax advisors who are on the ball to advise them, I'm afraid that they might just say, well, oh, if I can use a 550,000, that's like it was last year, like the $50,000 people. And now they just expanded the 3508S to be, I mean, that'll be the common wisdom out there on the street, that if you're less than 150,000, it's the same old 3508S that it was last year, and we don't have to worry about rage reductions and FT. I know that was my first reaction. When I first saw the 3508S and I saw they were talking about simplified forgiveness, I was like, oh, that's great. All of our clients who are less than $150,000 loans won't have to do wage reduction reports. I mean, we have them, they're available in the Viventi and PPP suite, but why have to go, you know, and then I started reading and our compliance team examined this and, you know, turned it up and down and we see, wow, this is really unbelievable they, 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 you, that all these employers but with, 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 you know, borrow between 50 and 150,000 still have to go through the whole 3508 process just in an implied way. It's not even here. They're just going to have to, that number that they put down here, requested loan forgiveness amount, that's going to have to be adjusted for wage reductions and FTE reductions. And here it is spelled out clearly. So that means you have to come up face to face with safe harbors. When do you have to count wage reductions and when don't you? And they're basically saying, go back to the instructions of the 3508. So here we have summarized the six safe harbors. Three of them apply to wage reductions. Four of them apply to FTE reductions, headcount reductions. And there's one that applies to both overlapping. First of all, if you didn't reduce any one particular employee's salary for more than 25%, then you're okay. In other words, if the pay during the covered period was at least, for each employee, was at least 75% of their pay during the look-back period, you're safe. And what is the look-back period when it comes to wage reduction? It's only January 1 to March 31 of 2020. You have no choice. First quarter of 2020, that's what you have to look back. By the way, for those of you who are finding yourselves in this situation between 50 and 150 and suspect that you may have to deal with wage reduction and, PPP and uh, FTE reduction, I want to invite you to take a listen and join in to the more than $150,000 webinar, the one where we're focusing on the larger loans, even though you're lower, but you still have to do all those same rules. So it probably would be helpful for you to join that session as well. Similarly, if you have an employee who earned more than $100,000 in 2019, you don't have to worry about their wage reduction. If, if you were paying someone $200,000 and now you're only paying them $100,000 or $101,000, SBA doesn't care. That, that's not the purpose of the Paycheck Protection Program. They're not out to protect the paychecks of the highly compensated employees. They're more concerned with your average folks and you know, just keeping their paychecks in place. So an employer is not penalized for wage reductions, even if they're more than 25%, for any employee who had an annualized equivalent 
it's an important term which I'm not going to go into right now, um, but it's an annualized equivalent of 100,000 in 2019. Um, and finally, the last one down at the bottom is, as we mentioned before, if you did have reductions between February 15th and April 26th, the COVID high season of 2020, at least we thought, Congress thought, and those reductions were restored by December 31st, then you're okay. You don't have to worry about that. And the same thing for FTE reductions. If you restored your headcount by December 31st, or if it's for a post-December 27th loan, you have until the end of your covered period. Uh, that's called the safe harbor two on the form when it comes to FTE, but it doesn't say that on the 3508S, but that's just on the regular 3508. Um, so then you don't have to, if, as long as you bring those numbers back up, you don't have to count those reductions. Now, again, here is where you have that discrepancy between the form and the actual rule of SBA. The form says not by 1231 or by the end of the covered period. It says on 1231 or on the end of the covered period. This is where you want to be speaking to your tax advisor to determine how to proceed. Um, and your three additional safe harbors for FTEs, if you did not reduce FTEs, you did not reduce employees or your paid hour count between January 20 and the end of your covered period, there is no alternative covered period anymore, the end of your covered period, then fine. Then even if you did have FTE reductions, we don't penalize you for them, we don't count them. If your FTE reductions were due to allowable circumstances, for example, you reduced an employee or you laid off an employee, you fired an employee due to cause, or the employee voluntarily terminated, or you may have laid them off, but then you offered them to come back aboard and they refused and you reported that refusal to the state unemployment agency, then you're fine. Then you don't have to worry about your FTE reductions. Um, or if you weren't able to operate, this is what we call the safe harbor one, you weren't able to operate uh, at the same level as pre-COVID due to federal government rules uh, posted between March 1st and 1231st, or if it's a later loan by the, by the end of your covered period, then again, we don't worry about safe harbors. So again, if you're finding yourself on a 3508S and you're finding yourself at a loss, well, how do I calculate wage reductions or FTE reductions? Uh, again, if you're with Viventium, you would be running the reports in our PPP suite. If you're not with Viventium, or even if you are, you may want to listen to some of our other sessions or join up or register for some of our upcoming sessions on full forgiveness under 3508. What about seasonal employers? So we said if you if you have a wage reduction, you have to compare that during your covered period, you have to compare that to first quarter of 2020. If you have an FTE reduction, you can actually pick what look back period you want to use. You can either compare your headcount during your covered period to your headcount during February 15th to June 30th of 2019. That's one choice. Go all the way back, kind of odd dates there, but February 15th to June 30th of 2019. Or alternately, you can use January 1st to February 29th of 2020. It was a leap year. January 1 to February 29 of 2020. Those are your two basic choices. And you want to pick the FTE look back period, usually, that has the lower count. Right? We'll talk about that. Why? We'll talk about why. Um, what if you're a seasonal employer, though? So can you do anything differently? And the answer is yeah. Under the old rules for the previous round of loans, uh, you could use any 12 weeks that fell, any 12 consecutive weeks between May 1st and September 15th of 19. Under the new rule, it's become more flexible. You can pick any 12 consecutive weeks between February 15th and February 15th, 2019 and 2020. So that's great news. That means if you had a very slow season where you had low FTE counts, you would want to use that most probably if you're a seasonal employer so that the threshold that you need to meet, that you need to live up to is very low. So that was additional flexibility provided for seasonal employers. Um, I mentioned before the employee retention credit. So take a look at what the instructions say. And here we're back on the instructions of the full 3508. Cause remember, if you're on a 3508S because you have a loan between 50 and 150,000, you still have to follow the instructions on the form 3508. Um, and it says here, do not include any wages that you've counted in determining the, uh, well, they mean the employee retention credit. I think the SBA makes typos sometimes too. So, you know, it's actually the employee, not the employer retention credit. Um, don't use any wages that you used to claim retention credit on. Don't use those as qualified PPP expenses. We mentioned that earlier, there's no double dipping. And similarly, it, how do you, figure out how much to limit the compensation of each employee. We, we said that before, but I want to show you to you here in, in the wording. If you are uh, the total amount of compensation eligible for forgiveness 
has to be prorated. It's $100,000 on an annual salary basis, and it's prorated for your covered period. So they give an example. Let's say you have an eight-week covered period. So it's eight out of 52 weeks times 100,000 that comes to 15,385. And if you have a 24-week covered period, so the maximum is going to be 46,154. Actually, I was kind of disappointed that they picked these two examples. Like these are like the old examples, the eight and the 24 weeks. It would have been nice if they did something exotic, like a 15-week covered period and show us how to prorate just as an example. But we get the idea. You take the number of weeks, whatever you're picking for your covered period, divide by 52. That gets multiplied by 100. And when you figure your payroll costs, you can't count more for any one employee than that number. Some important factors to keep in mind, just bubbles floating around. You can't count non-US residents in terms of your forgivable payroll costs, even if they're citizens. Someone might say, well, I have a social security number, I'm a citizen, it doesn't matter. If they're living outside the United States, they are not intended to be covered by the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, similarly, I just ran by that before, but if you want to reduce, if you want to avoid a forgiveness reduction, if you want to have what they call a reduction exemption, and you laid off an employee and you have offered to rehire them, it's not enough. You have to make the offer in writing and you have to report their refusal to return to the state unemployment office. Otherwise, you're not gonna get exempted from that reduction. Just a best practice here, again, if you wanna discuss with your uh, compensation team or perhaps with your legal, legal counsel, if possible, if you do need to reduce salaries, try to spread it around so that you're not reducing salaries for any one employee by more than 25% in order to avoid wage reductions. Again, if your loan is $50,000 or less, you don't have to worry about this point because you're not subject to wage reduction even if you did reduce everybody. It's only if you're between 50 and 150,000. Um, and again, if you're trying to, if, if you're above 150,000 and you're trying to qualify for the EZ, remember you can only qualify for the EZ if you didn't have wage reductions in excess of 25%. So it would be to your advantage to try to spread it out and not to reduce any one employee more than 25%. Um, we didn't get into the different ways of doing FTE, whether the simplified calculation, the exact calculation. Frankly, I never thought in giving a webinar about simplification to forgiveness, we would even be talking about the exact method or the simplified method of calculating FTEs, but that's the new situation that SBA has pretty much put upon us by saying that use the 3508S but do it according to the instructions of the 3508. So again, I would direct anyone who's in that situation to uh, check out our COVID-19 solutions page at eventium.com, where you'll find some really nifty resources that explain how to do this FTE simplified or exact calculation. And of course, as I mentioned before, if you're choosing a look back period, if you're a, a, a seasonal employer, you have three choices. You can take the February 15th to June 30th, 2019. You can take the January 1 to February 29th, 2020. Or you can take any 12 consecutive weeks between February 15th, 2019, February 15th, 2020. If you're not a seasonal employee employer, then you only have the first two choices. But in any case, you want to try to pick the look back period during which you had the lowest number of FTEs so that you have much less to live up to. All right, and here is the infographic that I've been referring to. This is just a great way of tracing where we've been and where we're going uh, in terms of from March 27th till now, it's been quite a journey, quite a journey. Uh, the two most important dates recently have been December 27th, that is when the Econ Economic Aid Act was passed. That's why that December 27th keeps appearing in all the instructions. That is what reopened the first and second draw loan program. And of course, January 19th is when all these forms were released, the 3508, that's the long form, the EZ and the S. And now a fourth form joined the TRIO, the 3508D. That is used for certain uh, disclosures that need to be made if there are government um, officials involved in the uh, entity that's applying for forgiveness, not too common a situation, but it is out there. And now we only have uh, one or two minutes left uh, to the time. So I do want to take a look that at the questions. Or I do want to repeat because I, I see the questions been asked. You will receive the slides and the recording after the meeting. Um, question. If only, let's say, 45% was used on payroll expense and 40% on qualified expense, would the 40% still count? Or does it have to be 60-40 if the 60 is 
under, then the 40 is less two. Okay, so basically it, there, there, at, at a time, the way it was originally written, it was like an all or nothing, but it's not an all or nothing anymore. What, what, what happens is, the calculation on the form is, we take your payroll expense and we gross it up, we divide it by 0.60. And that's the outer maximum of forgiveness. So let's say only 45% was used, whatever amount is used on payroll expense, and we can even take a look back just for purposes of answering this question, we can go back up to the original uh, EZ, which is where we have this. And um, if you take a look at line 11, it says payroll cost 60% requirement, divide line one. Okay, line one is your payroll costs. Divide that by 0.60, and that is an outer limit of how much forgiveness you can actually get. Okay, and we'll just do one more question in the interest of time, and I want to respect all your times. By the way, if anybody is interested in learning a little bit more about Viventium's product or services and how they might be able to help you, I'd invite you to go ahead and answer the one quick short question survey that we have on exiting this webinar. Um, and even if you're already a Viventium subscriber, you may be surprised to learn about some of the new services you didn't realize that Momentum offered. So if any of them look interesting to you, go ahead and check that off as you're, as you, as you're leaving. Um, question, please confirm that FICA employer share is not allowed for a PPP2 loan. So that's correct. Any employer taxes paid are only allowed to be deducted, whether it was a PPP one or two, it's only if it's a state or a local employer tax. But things like employer FICA or FUTA are not considered uh, not considered allowable expenses for forgiveness. So thank you for that question. Good to clarify. Well, that brings our webinar to a close today. And again, I want to invite you to uh, reach out to us to visit our ventium.com COVID-19 solutions page. You'll find lots of great resources there. And I want to thank you all very much for your time today and to wish you all much success, no matter which form you're going to use in obtaining full forgiveness for your PPP loans. Thanks so much and have a great day, everyone.